My name is Drea, this is Kyle. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, today we're going to talk about self-destructing messaging applications. Um, oh, he's not talking to me. Uh, and so I'm sure you all know, you've heard about Snapchat, Wicker, Facebook, po Tiger Text. They all kind of have their own purposes um, and different um, security measures which are in place. Um, self-destructing messaging apps basically allow a user to send a text, picture, video to another user and um, do it in a way which the message should then be deleted or burnt after reading. Um, the point of this presentation is basically to show you whether or not that's accurate and if there are any other supporting artifacts left behind. Um, we're also going to talk about smartphone forensics. Uh, we are forensic investigators. Um, and then we'll break down some of the artifacts based on operating system, iOS, Android, and then we're going to look at some network traffic. Um, the three apps that we're going to focus on, uh, Snapchat, Facebook, Poke, and Wicker, they are a very small subset of the whole, uh, as I'm sure you know, but um, obviously we had to focus on just a few. So our testing protocol, um, we wanted to look at the process from cradle to grave. Um, so we're going to look at network traffic analysis, um, application program interface, so API review, device analysis, sorry about that guys, and um, that is an empty slide. Okay. Um, so for testing we looked at iPhone 4 is running iOS 5 and 6, um, Samsung Galaxy S3 is running Jelly Bean and S3 Mini. Um, and then we use Cellebrite Physical Analyzer and Access Data and PE Plus. Um, these are just a few uh, of the forensic applications available for doing mobile forensics. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about a few of those in a minute. So the questions that we want to ask, um, where do the apps store data? Um, we'll talk about the user P list on an iPhone. Um, is data cached in multiple places? We're going to talk about metadata and then the data itself on an Android. Um, is the data encrypted? Um, and we're going to talk about the differences between apps like Wicker and Snapchat and their intentions, um, you know, why they exist. Um, are the messages recoverable? We're going to show you that in some cases, yes, they are. Um, and is there supporting evidence present? So we'll talk about empty files that show that there was an image present at one point in time and the evidence we can use from those files uh, to tie back to metadata and show the conversations happened when they happened and, and kind of what happened. So mobile forensics has come a whole long, a very, very long way. Um, it started out where investigators basically just had the phone itself. Um, they took pictures of whatever they saw on the screen and that was the evidence that they could kind of communicate. Um, we are now at a point where mobile forensics has gotten so um, intricate that we can actually recover memory off of a phone and full forensic artifact, uh, images, uh, physical images from devices with tools, hardware and software based tools. These are a few of those tools. Um, we've got the Cellebrite, um, Lantern, MPE Plus like I discussed before, even NK7 um, claims to have some pretty good forensic capabilities. Like I said earlier, we're focusing on the Celebrite Physical Analyzer and um, MPE Plus. Um, but so in the next few slides we're going to go through preservation on uh, iOS devices. Generally speaking, um, there are a lot of similarities with Android um, but we'll, we'll discuss a little bit of the differences um, between them. So iPhone 4S and newer, um, there are chipset requirements that prevent extraction. It's not OS related. That is kind of something that um, is, a, is misconstrued in the community. It is the chipset. It's not the operating system that prevents you from getting a physical preservation. But um, the 4 and older were actually able to get a full physical um, capture of the device. Um, that includes a full copy of flash memory. Um, it does require jailbreaking the phone. Um, <coughs> And there is a possibility of the, the file system being encrypted. So you may be able to get all this awesome information and not really be able to read it. Um, and as I said, iPhone, iPhone 3G, 3GS, and iPhone 4. So file system preservation. Uh, we're actually able to get a full copy of the file system. You're not going to get like that unallocated space. Um, this is kind of what the file system would look like in, in case, for example. Um, it also, um, 
requires jailbra jailbreaking for acquisition. It's an unencrypted copy of the file system because it's more logical than physical. And these are the devices that um, you can pull that kind of preservation from. Um, if we're forced to or unable to get a logical or physical acquisition, we will do just basically an iPhone uh, backup. We'll use um, iTunes and we'll get whatever iTunes can collect. Um, here's some of those items, photos, contacts, SMS and app data. And that's available on all iOS devices. Um, and during preservation, we can do physical preservation which will um, temporarily root the phone, similar to like jailbreaking an iOS device. Um, and in some cases we uh, use a bootloader for Samsung and Nokia phones. Uh, logical extraction, again, will give you the file system, application data, SMS, email, multimedia. So Snapchat um, is the first app that we're going to talk about. Um, while Snapchat positions itself as an ephemeral messaging application, uh, that's supposed to be used for lighthearted exchanges uh, with friends. It's, it's not hard to imagine that, um, that the, some of that could be abused. Um, this is just a few uh, articles that we did a simple Google search on showing how Snapchat has been used to do, you know, less than innocent type of activity. Um, Snapchat generally has had a reputation for being a sexing app, but with 150 million messages sent a day, it's hard to believe that those are all sex, right? But it's also, <laughs> <laughs> that would be really, uh, well, yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's also likely that that's not, it's not a trivial pr portion, right? It's, it's it, you know, there's going to be um, a, a good handful. Um, and this is just going to, it kind of uh, explains um, just in the last year, um, how the uh, growth of Snapchat has exploded, um, how many messages have been sent um, since 512 up through 413. Um, this is a snippet from the law enforcement guide. Um, kind of what we want to focus on here is uh, law enforcement even acknowledges that there is an ability to recover um, the image files from an image of a phone and they they say, well, as long as you don't open them first, we can recover them. And we kind of say the same thing. I think that there's always going to be supporting evidence like we mentioned before, but the key is if you're an investigator, you get one of these phones and you see that the Snapchat application is installed, um, obviously we don't want to be opening those images. All right, so, so I went through uh, several rounds of using Snapchat to exchange messages between iOS 5 and 6 devices. Um, and then we use Celebrite Physical Analyzer um, to gain full physical and file system extra extractions on each unit. Um, so I started trying to determine if I could find uh, the content that backed up uh, this information that you see on the screen, right? This is just an image of what Snapchat exchange would look like on a phone. Um, so basically what I did after taking that image is I ran a keyword search for my usernames and, um, and then I found this. Uh, this is a user.plist file. Uh, for those of you who are, are uh, familiar with plist files, they are used by uh, OS X and iOS um, to store configuration information and other settings. Um, they have two formats, binary and XML. Um, this file was unencrypted uh, in the test that we, uh, that we ran showed that it existed not only on the file system extractions but it was also um, accessible by iTunes backup which is interesting. Um, if you're able to get a backup off of the image of a computer for example, you might be able to get this information without having the phone itself. Um, so we opened up the user.plist file in Xcode and this is what it looks like. Uh, there were some things that were immediately interesting. Uh, we saw usernames, uh, Unix timestamps, and what appears to be message IDs. Um, so we have this metadata but it's not clear how these things are associated yet, um, which users received which messages when and with what message IDs. Um, so we looked into the plist format a little more and found that the user at plist um, is actually an S, an S key archiver object, um, which is data structure that Apple provides to developers um, to allow them to store objects and values in a plist file. Um, parsing that plist um, with, it's a cool, uh, really, very cool tool uh, from CCL Forensics, um, it's CDBP uh, Python module. Uh, and it shows that the plist contained a number of objects. Um, those related to this in interchange of information are displayed in this slide here. Um, there are a bunch of other uh, uh, objects that we um, were either null or not decoded. Um, 
They include device token, module verification, um, snap privacy, image caption. Um, we just didn't recover any of those in our testing. Okay, um, so the snaps object itself. It contains a list of the snap objects on the device, um, each of which contains metadata for the snap message that was sent or received by the user. Um, and it appears that the snap object is the backend storage um, of the list of messages so shown to the user in the message list. Uh, each snapped object contains the following elements, as you can see. Um, and then again, we had some elements that were either null or not decrypted. Um, and they were the display, screenshots, and view timestamps. I'm assuming um, that screenshots uh, field would be if somebody took a screenshot of a snap that you sent, and then you get that kind of message back, like, hey, the user took a screenshot of this image. So, so with the knowledge of the plist file and its structures, you can decode it and then prepare a table that looks kind of like this. Um, this metadata has power for us as forensic investigators. Um, we can say who's taking, talking to whom and when. Um, so for example, if you have a supervisor talking to an employee, you might have an HR issue. Um, if you have an accountant exchanging snaps right before a filing, you might have a problem. Um, if you have a student sending messages to a teacher, you might have a problem. So even without the contents of the image, um, this information still has investigative value to us. That being said, the question that everybody <laughs> is asking, I'm sure, is if the snaps themselves are recoverable. Um, specific to an iOS device on this screen, um, it looks like the photos cannot be readily recovered uh, from unjailbroken devices. Based on the behavior of the app and some conversations we have with um, reversers, it sounds like Snapchat is actually keeping those images in memory. Um, we haven't done any carving in a, of anal unallocated space because we just recently were able to um, uh, reverse the encryption, so maybe next year. Um, but with respect to video, um, unopened and received videos can be recovered from the device um, and, and it's actually stored on the device. So, is this what you're pick up? Android? Uh, yeah. I'll do this one. Okay. Um, so on Android, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, metadata is actually stored on the device. Um, and snaps themselves are more complicated. Uh, so Decipher Forensics is a forensic uh, firm, I think they're based out of Utah. Um, they found that images are stored unencrypted as unencrypted files on the file system even after they were opened. Um, others, including us, uh, have done a little bit more research and found that snapshots are deleted but only after the last message was received. So if you get five or six and you read five of the six, they're still recoverable. Um, and this is where I'm going to hand over to Kyle. Thanks, Drew. So again, I'm Kyle. So this is kind of um, taking a perspective of like a rooted Android device. So how many people out here have a rooted Android device that they use, right? So what I did is I, I got a uh, Samsung Galaxy S3 Mini. I rooted it, and then I um, just sent chat, you know, Snapchats back and forth to myself. So you can see initially on the right, on I think on the left hand side, the directory where that cached image is empty. You send, I sent myself two snaps. You go in that directory and you can see now there's two of these picture files that exist. So that kind of says, all right, now they're kind of, they're, you know, they're sitting on the phone themselves. You go, I went ahead and looked at one, went back to that directory, and you can see that the, file, the files actually still exist. Now I went back out, viewed the last one, and went back, and now they, they're gone. So kind of stepping back though, this is what I thought about the last couple of days, and this is really simplistic when you think about it. These files exist on here. You have your rooted device. So just CP it out to a, your SD card. Those files won't, those files will still be on the phone, and then you can take them off. And then, you, but the user that sent them to you will never know that you actually have a copy of the files now. Because you all know, if you use a Snapchat and you want to do that screen capture, you have to like, you know, quickly do a screen capture on your iPhone device. Or I, I'm not too familiar with the Android device to do the screen capture, but you can do the same thing. But that alerts the user that you took that screen capture of the photo. This way, they would have no idea that you have the factory photos. So then you can save them off and keep them as long as you want. So kind of we're stepping through, so we're looking at the, the network forensics, or sorry, the network analysis from this. So we kind of set up a, a man on metal proxy and then we set the messages back and forth to each other. So you know, it's kind of a hypothetical situation, you know, you have to kind of, you have to force a cert onto the phone, but yada, 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 but it still gives a perspective of what the messages look like underneath. So we, you know, we sent them back and forth and we're able to download it and it kind of gives you an idea of like what's the response and what's the um, request sent. So you kind of see this response here is actually very s similar to what's actually found in the user plist file. And this is, this is kind of talking on the uh, iPhone devices. 
So when you look at that, uh, but what's interesting about this, uh, this, this is sent from the Snapchat servers every single time a message is sent. So this is the content that's similar into, you know, that you'll find in the user plist file. And here is kind of what to note is the message ID in this one. So the message ID is what you want to tie back to that communication that goes back and forth between the two individuals. And then here what's interesting, this is um, uh, a, a picture that was sent, right? So you're kind of looking at it here and you're like, well, how do you know it's a picture what's sent? And, you know, we all know that the, you know, magic number in a picture file, you know, is in the beginning of, you know, in the raw data. But here it's not that. So this kind of alludes to the fact that there is some kind of encryption underneath, you know, SSL that Snapchat is using. So, you know, this, you say this is good though, you know, but we, you know, working with a couple of reverses out there, a couple, you know, these individuals had done some reversing on the APX file and were able to then determine that in reality it's a, it, encryption is very simple. They're using AES uh, electronic codebook mode and the key is a fixed key and that fixed key is for every single message that's sent. <laughs> so, it's very simplistically these two guys wrote their own, you know, PHP module and Ruby module. Before I even came across this, I was like, oh, well, now that I know the key based on um, this guy's blog here, which took me seconds to find that he posted, thankfully, I just wrote my own little Python script to then decode it, and I was like, oh, that was really simple. So I got to kind of looking at the uh, Snapchat. So now we're going to look at Facebook Poke. So Facebook Poke app is just, when we did it, was only for the iOS devices. Um, you know, the, their whole thing is after the message is sent, it's deleted from the app. It kind of has the same idea as um, Snapchat. You know, you can, the user has a timer set and that message will then self destruct or, you know, disappear once it's done. Well, is that really the case? And it's, you know, here's what we kind of the devices we use to do that. And, um, you know, again, we capture the traffic and we'll talk about that as we step through. So, look on the device. Um, keep in mind these GUIDs change per install. So, these are just kind of specific to my device that I had. But when you, when you looked in these directories on the, uh, under the iPhone, you know, you, you see these directories. So it had this um, one file, which, or one directory that contained a cached SQLite. So it basically cached the photos of your Facebook profile pictures and that's, it stored it in there. And then it had another directory, the one right below that, that actually had the pictures. So now you kind of have the users that, that you communicated with and a, a thumbnail of the pictures you communicated with. But what really was, you know, the all be all for at least a digital forensic uh, approach is in the store.sql um, database. This database probably had about, I, I, want, I, can't, I didn't remember counting, but like at least 50 tables in it. But this one table of interest is a Z poke messages table. So in here we were able to find recipients um, in a counter. Um, you had the sender, you had a time limit, you had a creation time, you had the media type that was sent, and then you had any text that was sent with that. So you, you, we all know that you can send, you can never send a text to the person, you can send a photo to the person, but then you can send a photo with text to the person. So all this is stored in this database. Um, and here's just a kind of picture of it and showing you kind of the one that highlighted, you can see that the message field itself is null, so, but still text was sent. So this stored everything that was sent. Um, and then the other table underneath that is a Z poke messages edge. So you can do a join on that table. And then you can see the viewer state itself. You can see when they viewed it, what time they viewed it, um, whether they did a screen capture of it or not. So, like putting all this together, you can really draw the picture to what's going on. Maybe you don't have the photos, but again, like we did earlier, you can see that these communications exist. You can build a spreadsheet and you can be like, yes, you talked to Jane at 7 p.m. on Sunday and you sent this type of message to her. And this is the text that might have been included. And then you know, just in this whole um, table itself, or in this database itself, there's another table that is the avatar table, and this included like your um, Facebook ID. So you can add, you can based on this whole one database alone, you can build the whole structure of this communication of the one person's device. So this is another um, the um, snapshots. Is it kind of a transition directory on iOS devices? When you kind of hit the home screen, it takes a snapshot of the message you're, the app you're in. So this a snapshot of the message home screen was actually saved inside this directory. So you have what is to be like a communication. So the user can clear this this kind of tracking of the communication they're having. But if not, and you you know you exit the app, it takes a screenshot of it. And Facebook's post case they left when they programmed that they left that function on. So then you can see now. Who, messages that were sent and, and when they were sent to individuals. Um, and then in one of these other directories you have plist files. So 
I redact them. I don't know why I did because it doesn't really matter. Because these are but my Facebook IDs that I use for this. And basically it stores that information. So you know you can take that Facebook ID number and you can go to the um, I think I have it on the next slide, like a developer explorer from Facebook, you can put that ID in and you can see the actual username that's tied to that ID. That's open source so that's all out there. So then you have, I mean you have these other user agent, you have the login ID, you have the last time they registered Facebook. So you have this big, you can build this big picture of when this user was communicating, using this app, who they were talking to, when they were talking to them. So then we could look at the network analysis side of the stuff. Um, you know, we see these posts, that's like when you send a message, they all look like this kind of post. When you receive the message, it does a get request and a post request as well. But what's interesting and different from Snapchat is Facebook just uh, does a, just gzips encodes it. So what's nice about man to mail proxy, it strips that off. So actually there's really no underlying encryption under SSL uh, using Facebook poke. You know, unlike Snapchat they use the 16 byte key, these, they, these guys don't do that. So you're able to then, you know, easily, um, save out pictures and, uh, that were sent. So if you're able to, you know, capture their traffic that way, you can then. Um, it also keeps fields of whether what text was sent, if a picture was sent, and if a picture was sent with text. So this is all caught in, the, you know, this is all in the payload of the traffic itself. And this is that link I was talking about. You can take that user ID back here that I, I redacted for no reason, and then send it to this link, and it can say it'll say my name was tied to that user ID. So if you you have those plist files that contain those, that number, you can take that and you can figure out who that actually, you know, the name they have registered with Facebook. So this is kind of taking a look from the perspective of what the traffic looks like itself. Um, this is a payload of the picture. So it, so it, you can see in the blue text it, it recognized it was gzip encoded, strips that off for you. So the underlying payload itself you can, you know, it's the JPEG payload. And then you can, here you can see there's a picture message that's text and it actually stores in a message field. It says basketball hoop. So now you, you can really draw this big picture if you're able to capture traffic. And uh, the biggest thing we're kind of draw here is that Snapchat uses the encryption, Wicker uses encryption, but Facebook really doesn't use any encryption. So last week we, we took a look at Wicker, and you know we kind of did the same kind of approach. Um, you know they, they claim to leave no trace. Um, their device or their app is you know FIPS you know 140-2 HIPAA NSA Suite B compliant, and they use AES 256 encryption. So the idea here was to kind of show, we, we did two fun apps, you know, Snapchat and Facebook Poke, but we kind of look at a corporate level, um, one that's more targeted towards the business folks. So in doing the analysis and pulling, doing the physical um, extraction of the device, the iOS device, you know, you still have these directories under, you know, based on the GUIDs, but in containing all of them, I wasn't finding anything of interest. They're, either they were empty, um, files were all nulled out, um, contained no content, and um, it, it had some plist files, but all it had all the information that regards regarded to the directory of, of interest. So, I mean, nothing that you didn't already know that was stored in these plist files. And then, looking at the network traffic side, I'm like, well, maybe there's something in the network traffic itself, and then I can, we can pull out there. Um, you know, all the messages that were sent looked like that. You know, that PHP file was sent. That's a, it, all of them looked like that downloaded. Um, the only thing I was able to really do because after that it was still encrypted. Um, you can take a baseline that when I send a text versus sending a picture versus sending a video, the payload itself is you know, obviously larger which we expect. But if you have no baseline, you still can't say whether a picture was sent or just text was sent or just you know, um, a video was sent. And then the only thing I found that just stood out immediately is that the first five bytes of each of the payloads were the same. But, and then you can argue that, you know, well you can still, you know, Get, grab that phone, you know, that picture might still be in memory, and then, you know, if you did a memory extraction, you'll be able to then get that picture. Well, no, it's still crypt cryptographically protected. Um, each of the keys are initiated for each user um, each time. So this is kind of like what it looks like under, this is uh, the payload in man mill proxy. So you can see it's, it's nothing. I mean, it's, it's all scrambled. Um, I didn't do crazy crypt analysis on it, um, not like I used to do, but I didn't want to spend time doing that. And you know, so it was just kind of highlight that they use, they are, they're doing what they said they're doing. They're, you know, they're encrypting the payload. You, you can't find, you can't get anything out of it. And this is a sample of a received message that was sent. So, I mean, you can see between the two, the first five bytes are similar, but that's about it. So, uh, kind of to summarize it all, um, on the iOS devices, what's of interest? Well, you have the user.plist file. 
Um, on the Android devices, you have that XML file. They kind of link up to each other about the same. They can contain the same amount of metadata, times of message was sent, whether it was a picture message, who the users were, how long the, um, you know, was it viewed, when was it sent. And then um, what's specific to the Android devices is that you have those cache images. And like as I said like earlier, like if you have a rooted device, you can copy those pictures out anytime someone sends you a Snapchat. Before look, it, even before looking at it, you can see who sent it to you. If you don't open it up, you can you know CD to that directory and copy those out, and they'll never know that you did that. So, so some future research that we're kind of looking at doing is doing unallocated string searching. Um, you know, why didn't we do that? Well, we spent a lot of time trying to do network traffic analysis and looking at the actual physical, like what else could we find in just open files themselves. And the big thing I was trying to do before I come uh, came here was to do the memory extraction of the Android devices using Lime. Um, since I have that root. Really you know, Samsung Galaxy S3 phone. I was like, I know these pictures are going to be in memory, but unfortunately, the kernels are using, and they, they didn't have a configuration set that specifically used for Lime. But I'm going to figure that out because you can do it on different devices. I think it was just these Samsung devices. They don't they configure the kernels differently. So that's really it. Um, here's some of the tools and sources we used. You know, you know, thanking those people as well, and. Um, we have some time, and best, I guess there's not any, there's not a Q&A room anymore apparently. So we have some time left here. If you guys uh, have any questions you want to ask, and uh, we have 15 minutes, so if anybody has any questions, this is Dre and I. If you want to <laughs> contact us, let us know. Reach out to us. Okay. So we did. So like those are in some cases. So sorry. The question was uh, we talked about a lot of received messages. So did we have anything about the sent messages? So nothing that I came across when I was doing did I ever find any like of the sent messages I sent. Uh, I, I had some on the Android. Some, sometimes in the uh, on the Android you'll have it in the same cache database. I'm sorry. Sometimes on the Android phone and the same cache database of the received messages, the sent messages will be there also. I'm sorry. I don't know. Let's, let's go ahead. Uh, Snapchat, you mentioned that images are only deleted once the last image was viewed. Have you tried getting out into a state where it believes that the one image is always counting to keep the images stored? We have not tried that. Well, yeah, we so, have so the been. question was, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> the question was, um, did we ever try to trick the app into making it think that, um, wait, wait. One more pending image, so that we can see if they all. Did. We, I, I didn't do that at all in my testing at all. Um, possibly could be done, and it would take a little more of reversing. I didn't personally reverse the uh, APX on the Android devices, so we used a lot of you know previous open source research that did that. That might be something to think about and you know look at a little further. And how can we trick it? You should mention Snapchat coming up. Oh yeah, so there was, uh, we, we worked with another colleague that actually created an API to um, work, you know, third party API to work with Snapchat and he caught wind of Snapchat getting a little finicky about that so he actually pulled that down and removed that from GitHub so we were going to talk to that and explain his little research that he did but um, he, there was that, you know, there was rumors that Snapchat didn't like that so he pulled down his API. He okay. Yeah, if you want to, there's a mic in the center if you want to walk up and ask questions, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the question was, is there any work on iMessage? No, we actually didn't do any of that. We're just kind of looking at these specific apps. Um, there's a few others like Silent Circle has a similar kind of setup of self-destructing, but they have a paid service and yeah, we could have done that and paid it and, and you know, our company might have paid for that, but we just didn't go that route. Tiger text? Yeah, the one, the one Tiger text? Oh, uh, no. I, I did, we did do some research with Tiger text, though, which is um, it's a secure, like, email. Um, and, and we were able to recover mess, uh, pictures, but no communication information. Okay, thanks. Is it the buzz of increasing the amount of mass station structure that's the same on the receiving end 
modify modify the database for the message is open. For instance, we modify the value of the say uh, the maximum time limit. Right. So. So for our purposes as forensic investigators, and I'm sorry, I can't repeat that whole question, but I can say this, we're always dealing with like what, what comes into us, so it's very hard for us to do kind of like preventative work or, you know, um, exploit the device in any way, shape or form. We're, we're kind of getting it as evidence. Um, so a lot of that research is very interesting. It's just really not been stuff that we've looked into. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, I you know, appreciate it. There's definitely more people than I expected. <laughs> <laughs>